and welcome to the MBOM podcast, where you'll learn to master the business of yoga. MBOM is a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Amanda Kingsmith. I'm a 500 hour registered yoga teacher, a yoga business coach, and a total business geek. Here at MBOM, you'll learn everything you need to know to create a sustainable yoga business by learning from myself and guests from around the world about how they built their yoga businesses and about how you too can become a successful yoga teacher, studio owner, and much more. All right, let's dive in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mastering the Business of Yoga. As always, I am really excited and grateful that you've joined me for today's episode of the show. And this week on the podcast, I am excited to be joined by Manu Molina. Manu is originally from Andalusia, Spain, but has lived in many places and spent most of his life as a globetrotter. He's on a mission to help yoga and wellness professionals to radically transform their marketing and biz game so that they can navigate the industry fearlessly with clarity and achieve sustained success. And a big part of Manu's focus is on retreats, both organizing and running his own, as well as supporting other retreat leaders who need logistics, marketing, and organizational support. And this is exactly what we dive into in this episode of the show. Manu shares his top tips for running successful retreats, including how to choose a length of retreat, a destination, a theme, how to price your retreat so that you're profitable, how to market your retreat, and so much more. So this episode is jam-packed with goodness. If you are somebody who is wanting to host retreats or has hosted retreats and wants to level up, or is maybe thinking about this as an option for your business, then this episode definitely has some amazing and actionable information for you. So why don't we get into it? Without further ado, here is Manu. Welcome to the podcast today, Manu. I'm really excited to have you here with me today. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm really excited uh, as well and really grateful to have this opportunity to connect with you and to connect with your community. Yeah, yeah, me too. I feel like we were talking before how we've been kind of circling the same, I guess, circles, you could say for a while. And so I feel like it's, it's about time that I got you on the show and got to get to know you and connect with you. So I'm curious where you're joining us from today, first of all. Uh, Well, right now, I am in uh, southern Spain, which is basically the place that I'm from. I'm from Andalusia, which is, you know, it's very famous for the flamenco. (laughs) In particular, the place that I'm from, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a province that is very famous for the olive oil. We have a lot of olive oil production in here. But I, I am originally from here. I travel and lived in so many places in the world. And right now, I am in a transition because towards the end of this month, we are in April. Towards the end of this month, I'm going to be traveling to Thailand, which is where uh, this is where I spent or at least try to spend most of my time. Because my, 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 my husband, uh, it's uh, from Thailand and we do have a house there in Bangkok. Oh, amazing. I feel like splitting time between Spain and, and Thailand sounds pretty incredible to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I definitely love it. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I'm curious if we can dive in and start with how you first got into yoga. Can you tell us a little bit about your yoga story? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I started the first time I I started in uh, I started yoga was around 2004. That was the first yoga class that that was when I took my first yoga class and that was when I was living in the Spanish Pyrenees. And uh, you know, for some reason Amanda, I felt connection to yoga and you know, other kind of mystical disciplines if we can call them that way. I felt an attraction to that, and uh, but I didn't really, really experience until 2004, which is when I took my first yoga class. And I instantly felt a connection. It felt something, it felt like, it felt like something that I really, I really resonated with. And yeah, that was how I dive, how I stepped into yoga. Amazing. I love that. And then what kind of inspired you to take the next step to become a teacher? Yeah, well, so one of the things like after, you know, as I was starting taking these yoga classes that I started in the Pyrenees, and I felt I felt the calling, you know, it was I think after two or three classes that I felt like, wow, this was so right to me. And especially as I was starting to feel 
the benefits that I would that I would feel after each class, you know, especially when I got to be a little bit more consistent and I was starting to go like twice a week or so, I was starting to feel much better in my body. And for me, I think uh, or I feel the yoga practice also, it helped me in a way that it kind of empowered me, especially back at that time, I felt I have a little bit of self-esteem issues. I didn't feel very comfortable with myself. Um, and I think yoga was like a healing practice. So I kind of felt that, you know, that was something that, that this was very helpful for me. And uh, I wanted also to, to help other people to kind of have also that same emotional healing or that kind of transformation that I, that I was also experiencing in myself. Hey, yoga teachers, do you work for a small studio that is in need of a reliable software solution? Too often, the smaller businesses out there get stuck using a complex software solution that's too expensive and a poor fit for their business needs. Paying too much for software features they don't need or use is literally throwing money away. But our friends at Offering Tree have stepped up to help folks just like you. They recently released a version of their studio software for boutique studios called Studio Light. This package comes with all the features you need to run your studio, including marketing automation, staff payroll, details reporting, and more. And it comes with a low price tag, a brilliant support team, and customized migration to make the transition from one software to another as seamless as possible. What more could you want? You can go ahead and book a quick demo with Offering Tree to learn more. Use the link offeringtree.com forward slash mbom to access my partner discount of 50% off your first three months or 15% off your first annual Studio Light plan. Once again, that's offeringtree.com forward slash mbom to get started. All right, now back to the episode. Oh, that's wonderful. I love hearing that. It's it's always really cool to hear like what brought somebody to the practice and then also like what inspired them to teach. And I love for you that it was like kind of like love at first few classes. You were like right away, like, hey, this is something I want to share with other people. And so I'm curious if you can kind of walk me through your career over the years. Like what did those, did you start teaching right away once you got your teacher training or what did that look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my yoga career has been tied up to the retreat environment. And this is something we also probably going to be talking about today, a little bit about the, the retreat stuff. But my yoga career has been a little bit tied up because after that first class that I had, after those first classes that I had in 2004, you know, my yoga practice remained like something, it wasn't very consistent, but around 2007, back at that time, I just moved to Italy and I decided, you know what, I'm going to do a teacher training. You know, I, it was like already three years that I was practicing now and then I knew it was something that I really liked. And I was like, okay, let's dive into a teacher training. So just landed into Italy and I found that there was this teacher training in Ashtanga Yoga. Back at the time, Amanda, I didn't have an idea of what Ashtanga Yoga was, but I was like, you know, this is the only teacher training available in Italy right now. And so I'm going to take it, you know? And so I just dive in into the Ashtanga Yoga world. This is like kind of my, the foundation of my practice, I would say it was, it was Ashtanga. As you know, it's a very strong discipline, but I, but I, you know, I drink the discipline of Ashtanga almost like if it was water, you know, I felt like very connected to, to that day after day practice. And this is something that I self-practice, which is, which is something that, that it's part of the Ashtanga practice. It's almost something that I developed from the first day because the teacher training, it was kind of in the North of Italy. And the, I was living in the south of Italy. So basically, I would go to the north of Italy once a month. And then the rest of the month, I would be just like kind of developing my self-practice on my own at home. So it was an amazing way to, to kind of integrate everything that I was learning. And something really interesting and really funny is that during those trips, imagine like I was living in southern Italy. This is not my country. Italy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there because the previous relationship that I had. And then I met this person who was the only other person from Southern Italy, from, from that area, that was taking the, that teacher training. And she became my friend, my friend Francesca. Francesca, you're listening. Hi from here. 
And we were basically, you know, we would travel from the south of Italy to the, to, to the north. And she happened to own a retreat center in southern Italy. And in that retreat center, you know, she was, she was like almost starting and she was bringing kind of some of the best Astanga yoga teachers. So, you know, fast forward to th- next summer, 2008, and I started to work there. I was just like, you know what? The, I think this is going to be the best opportunity for me, not only to develop as a teacher, but also to understand this kind of environment, you know, this retreat environment where people come and spend some time doing yoga and so on. And so that took me like from 2008 until 2012-ish, I was basically working all of the summers into this retreat in Southern Italy. And I was learning, again, all of the discipline of the Ashtanga, practicing with different teachers, teaching classes now and then. This is where I started to, to teach some classes. And, and then also in two, around 2010, I did my first trip to India, to Mysore, you know, because there is where it's, the, it's almost like a kind of the source of the Ashtanga, you know. All of the teachers would tell me, you know, you need to go to Mysore, you need to practice there. And this is what I did. I went there. That was 2010. I spent a couple of months practicing there. And when I came back to Italy from that trip, before 2010, I, I was teaching now and then like kind of gaining experience and so on but I wouldn't take it like kind of very seriously but when I came back from India from Mysore I felt that was my time to start teaching you know I felt so inspired I didn't have any certification because I don't know if you know this but in the Ashtanga kind of world if you want to get the authentic certification or the real certification from uh, from the source, from Platavi Joyce or Sharat, you need to, you know, it's not established a specific, like you need to go a number of times and they would decide. So I came back from, from India to Italy. I didn't have any certification, but I was like, you know what? I feel ready. I've been practicing for a few years. I have a consistent practice and uh, I think I can help other people who are a little bit behind me in the journey. And this is how how I started, I, that was actually my first entrepreneurial venture. I created a small yoga shala in my, in my house. That was Southern Italy, a small village. And I remember having so many questions, Amanda, because I was thinking like, wow, people in Southern Italy, they are so religious. And I was such a devoted Ashtanga practitioner. Like I would chant the Vande Guru Nam, you know, like kind of the mantra at the beginning. And I was thinking like, how Italian people from Southern Italy, they are very religious. How are they going to take, you know, just like kind of starting a, a class, chanting a mantra. And, you know, I was blown away how people really loved that. That was really, really interesting and surprising. And, you know, I, I remember also having like kind of a very kind of light bulb moments. You know, I was coming from India practicing like I, I was very young I could do anything with my body but the first one of the first clients that I had was this lady she was basically around 55 years old or uh, and she never done anything in her life so the first time I put her to do a sun salutation I feel like oh wow like I need to modify everything here you know so that was like a great experience yeah yeah and fast forward to end of 2012 for personal reasons, you know, I, I had a breakup with my, with my previous partner. So I had to, to finish that studio. If it was today, I would probably have kept my students during, you know, taking them online. Yeah. Back in 2012, we didn't have like online. I'm sure there was something, you know, but it was probably very rare. It was a different world though. I mean, yoga was so different in 2012. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I remember back in those days, I would use Facebook for doing some promotion for sure. But, you know, mainly was I would even do like the poster, you know, and, and, and do flyers and, and stuff like that. But yeah, something something that I got from that from that period, I remember I, I felt that that was my calling. I felt that I, I really, really wanted to to continue teaching and learning and helping other people. But I already set up also my, my, I wanted also to go to Asia. I remember when I was working in that retreat in Italy, 
some of the people who were coming there, some of the teachers, they were speaking about Asia and Thailand and how amazing those countries are. And then I was just like, you know what? I think I, I want to go there. I don't know how, I don't know when, but that's something that's going to happen. So after I left Italy, I, I, I moved to Spain and I looked for, for another job. And I was like, okay, I have this retreat experience where, you know, this experience was amazing because it allowed me to see the thing from the inside out. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to look for another, for another retreat somewhere there. And I, and I found this place in Canary Islands in Spain. And this was a yoga and Pilates retreat. And, and I, I applied for a job there. And I, I ended up working for them. And again, it was a very famili- family style, familiar kind of environment, like very small with a few rooms. But it was, again, a great opportunity for me because it was such a small place that you would do different things here and there. So you get to know like kind of the behind the scenes, you know, from everything that's happening from a retreat, from the teacher perspective, because I was teaching some classes, but also from other perspectives. Some of the things that I was also doing in that, in that retreat was I was into the kitchen as well, because this is part of my background. I, I was very interested back in the days into all of the nutrition and vegetarianism and all of that. But as I was there, you know, I, I, my goal, again, it's like I want to develop my career as a yoga teacher. I think the retreat environment is great. It's amazing for that. It allows me to connect with a lot of teachers, allowed me to practice and to drink from different sources and to, and to learn. But I was like, I want to do my teacher training and do my teacher training in Asia. Because that teacher training that I started in Italy was almost like a door that opens for me into the world of yoga. But I never got to finish that teacher training in Italy because it was like a kind of a three-year thing. And, and it was just like kind of too long. So I don't know if I'm talking too much, Amanda, maybe just let me know. Oh, no, this is great. I love hearing this. It's cool to hear like okay. the evolution and then we'll, we'll get to like the nitty gritty of retreats. <laughs> okay. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. So, well, let's then fast forward to 2014. This is when, you know, after the period I was working in, in Canary Islands in this, in this second retreat that I, that I work, I went to, I, I was preparing for my, I signed up for a teacher training in Thailand, in Southern Thailand. And this was something that I felt very inspired to sign up because it was, the, this teacher training had all of the background from Ashtanga. It was like kind of the structure. It was like very Ashtanga, Ashtangi-ish kind of practice, but they would also integrate pranayama, a lot of breath work and, uh, and meditation and other practices that I was also interested in learning. So 2014, I went to Thailand, do my teacher training, my first 200 hours, and, and uh, you know, fell in love. I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with my current husband, which I met there. And I fell in love with the retreat center that I took my teacher training. This place, it's called Samahita, and it's a wonderful place. So, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I got my certification in 2014, go back to, to Spain and, and I do have a boyfriend in Thailand. I do have a place that I really, really love and I was very connected and I was there. As I was there, I, you know, talked to the owner and I say, you know, I really love this place. I would like to come here because again, I knew that this was going to be a very good development for me as a teacher, you know, to be able to be, to be into this environment where I'm going to be able not only to teach on a daily basis, but also to take classes from other teachers and to see the retreats kind of behind the scenes, which is something that it was very fascinating to me. So yeah, 2014, that was what was happening. Then one year after, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to China. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I have this adventurous spirit. So I was like, I'm going to leave everything behind here in, in Spain and just go to Thailand and see what happened. And, you know, I was very lucky that 
only a few months after I left for Thailand, there was a job opportunity that came that came up in this place in the in the retreat that I took my teacher training. Oh, so cool. you know, it meant to be. <laughs> it's meant to be. It's meant to be. You know, uh, like when I was there, they told me it was uh, they didn't have any openings or anything. But when I went in 2015 to Thailand, all of a sudden, someone who was working there decided that it was her time to leave. So, you know, voila, here I am. Okay. <laughs> and that was a, 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 a time, I remember that as a time of massive, massive growth as a teacher. I remember I started working as community manager and, you know, managing their social media on the side of teaching. Teaching was like a kind of a day-to-day, day-to-day practice that we would do. We would teach the 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 guests that would come for a for a wellness program, but also they would do, we would do four teacher trainings a year. So I eventually became also part of the teacher training, uh, part of the teachers, and I felt that that was something that I really, really, really loved. And I got to in that place. I I got to connect also with amazing yoga teachers who, especially if you're familiar with the with the Ashtanga world, like Richard Freeman and Mary Taylor. They were usual guests that they would come to run retreats. Tiffany Cruikshank, Rodney Yee, you know, people like really, really well known. And I was, I felt like it was amazing, you know, that I got to, to work with these people and to take their classes. So, yeah, in this place, I basically have this, eventually I became the retreat coordinator. That was like kind of the position that fell into my lap. I started with the, with the community manager, but then I ended up being the, the retreat coordinator. And so what I would do was for all of these, some of them big names, some of them, you know, retreat leaders that maybe they were not very well known, but they would bring a group of people. I was the kind of the person that was like kind of organizing everything behind the scenes for the retreat to be perfect. So connected with the retreat leader and making sure and making sure all of the logistics logistics was were taken care of. And here's where the interesting part of the story starts, I would say, Amanda, because you know, after after I was there for I would say a couple of years and a half or so. And then I spent also a few months in another place, which was like a wellness sanctuary. All of that is in the south of Thailand. But then by the end of 2018, I feel like, you know what? I am ready to set up my venture. I am ready to become an independent yoga movement teacher. And I'm going to do that in Bangkok, Thailand. (laughs) Yes. This is where where my my husband lives, and uh, you know I was like, okay, I just gonna start it there. And uh, this I cannot tell you, you cannot imagine, Amanda, how many struggles I found there. Because despite my experience, first of all, despite all of my knowledge about yoga, pranayama, you know, I study everything. I have countless hours of education in yoga. I did have some background also in, you know, in social media, being the community manager, some background in marketing and so on. But I didn't really have the knowledge that is required for business, you know, and this is, I remember like, oh my gosh, even though I've been, you know, doing stuff for a retreat center, it's not the same like if you're going to do that for yourself as an independent teacher. So that was like a kind of the end of 2018. It was like a kind of a little bit of a dark night of the soul because I wanted to set up this company in Thailand, which by the way, was also like kind of complicated to set up everything legally and stuff. And I also felt like it was difficult to navigate the the online. And this is where I decided that I was going to invest into some business mentoring. This is where when I was thinking like, you know what, I, if I want to do something out of this, if, if I want to do a career out of teaching yoga, I really need to, to invest. I really need to have someone help me to do that. And this is what I did. I started to work with business coaches, business mentors, and eventually things got much better. And by 
2000 and end of 2019, 2020. I'm not going to tell you that things were like perfect. I still have some little struggles, but I have a much clearer idea of how, how to run my business. My company is already set up. I was already running retreats in, 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 in there in Southern Thailand. And I was collaborating with some yoga studios and fitness centers in Bangkok uh, doing teacher trainings. And I also had my private clients. And so it felt like a win. You know, it felt like I was already starting. I was already starting to feel, you know, the results of working with people that were helping me to find my way as an independent, doing an independent living as, a, as an independent yoga teacher. And that lasted. And then the pandemic happened. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So many people I've talked to feel like they had like these big, it's like big breakthroughs with their business or their journey, like end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Like I feel like 2020 was this year for so many people where we're like 2020, we're like hitting the ground running, we're doing awesome stuff. And then it's like, oh, just kidding. Global pandemic. Exactly. You know, I was just like, wow, how this can be. So yeah, I, what what I did, I had to close up everything basically, because, you know, a Thai company, I'm not going to get into details, but it's a little bit complicated. And also as a foreigner, it's not super easy. You have high costs as well. I could afford that cost when I was doing my, my retreats, because, uh, you know, that was like one of the most profitable parts of my business. And at the moment I, I have to stop the retreats, it didn't make sense for me to, to continue with, with the company. We didn't know, remember, we didn't know how long that was going to last. I was like, you know, I cannot keep continue paying every month for such a high cost without being able to run my own retreats. So that was a huge shift for me. And this part of my story, I think it has to do a lot with, you know, adapting and, uh, and kind of resilience because I still wanted to move forward. I didn't know what I was going to do, but something really funny happened. And it's that in 2020, actually before 2020, I was teaching some of the clients that I have, they were online clients. And that was something almost unheard. Even in 2020, when I had some of the clients that they would come maybe to my retreats, and then they would go back to Europe and they wanted to continue with me. I offered them the, the option of practicing with Zoom. But, you know, I remember like when I was mentioning Zoom to people in 2019, people were like, Zoom, what is that? I, I, I'm not sure what is that. I was like, no worries. You know, I sent you a link and we're practicing. Click, together. click on this link and then I'll be there. Click. <laughs> exactly. And so what happened is that because uh, yoga teachers in my, within my circles, within my social media, during 2020, during the pandemic, they've been seeing me before uh, the, the, the previous year. They saw me promoting my online classes yoga teachers started to connect with me and say, hey, Manu, I've seen you, you're doing online classes. How do you do that? And uh, I would be super interested to learn. So I decided right there in 2020 that I was going to, I started to helping yoga teachers with the online part, you know, setting up their, their yoga classes, using Zoom. Remember all of those questions we used to have about microphone? Yeah, totally. <laughs> All of this techy stuff, I, I started helping yoga teachers with that. But then most of the most of the students that I had, the next questions after they set up their classes on Zoom, the next question they started to have, it was like, how, well, how do I market my classes? How do I navigate social media? How do I, you know, connect with my students and, and do my classes in marketing? And I was like, okay. You know, this is something that drew in a little bit from my own struggles that I had, uh, like the 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 couple of year, couple of years before when I, this is when I started in Bangkok. I started to share that with other yoga teachers, and I found that that was my passion. I realized that you know, teaching about marketing, business, you know, setting up online was something that I felt like really, really passionate about. And basically, this is what I've been doing since 2020 until basically right now. I did have a little bit of a gap because in 2022, 
I had a, a career opportunity show up for me. And uh, that was in, in a huge hotel in, in Ibiza that is called Six Senses. I don't know if you're familiar with the brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I've heard of it. They are, they are very common. They are very popular. They started in Asia, but now they are expanding all around the world. And they are a big wellness brand hotel. It's a luxury five-star hotel. It was, it was a massive, huge property with 116 rooms and 19, 19 villas and two mansions. And basically, they, they, wanted to, to, they wanted to teach retreats. And this is very interesting, Amanda, for this conversation today. And I, I would like every yoga teacher who is listening to pay attention to this because suddenly you see hotels and big brands, you know, they think that retreats, it's a good idea. So this tells something. This tells that their retreat industry, the retreat sector is growing and, and they can see that. And, but obviously, you know, they, this hotel, they do have a lot of background into all of the hotel stuff, but they didn't have any background on retreats. So I took this job opportunity. I actually started as a consultant. I, I did like a two or three months as a consultant for them, just like kind of setting up everything basically looking at the calendar, the yearly calendar, connecting with retreat leaders, looking at the budget, looking at the profitability of the retreats, more like a kind of the corporate side, so to speak, but also looking into the logistics. You know, we would have like retreat leaders coming, organizing the retreat. So I was basically the person who would coordinate everything within the hotel just to for these retreat leaders to have a great experience. And so yeah, I I took this opportunity, but then I I finished that project towards the end of 2023. And 2024, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go back to being my own boss because this is what I like the most. I really thought it was a great opportunity for me to grow and develop even a little bit more on retreats because this is something I feel passionate about. But I, I, there is nothing that I enjoy more than, you know, just working independently and helping other yoga and wellness practitioners. Right now, I'm also working with, with yoga and wellness practitioners who are planning to run a retreat and they feel like kind of scared of the logistics or they don't know how and where to start. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing all of that. You have such a dynamic story and just have done so much cool stuff over the last I guess, what is it, 15 years, 20 years. So very, very cool to hear that. And I'm curious, have you gone back to running retreats yourself? I am planning, I this week as we are talking, I am planning to, to launch my landing page for my upcoming retreat that it's going to oh. be next year. Exciting. Yeah, yeah very exciting. It's, it's not a retreat exactly because this is going to be a boot camp, but it has all of the elements of a retreat. So this is going to be also in Thailand, in the, basically in the place that I, that I really love. And, and it's not technically a retreat, but you know, there is food, there is room included, accommodate, sorry, food, treats, and so on. Amazing. Well, we'll have to stay tuned for that. You'll have to give us more information. Yes. But I feel like retreats is one of these things that a lot of yoga teachers are interested in. I feel like when I teach newer yoga teachers, it's something that when I, when I teach them the business of yoga and, you know, all the options that they can do with their careers, there's always a lot of like, Ooh, retreats. That sounds really cool. So I would love to dive into that a little bit more and just hear some of your top tips for running successful, successful retreats. So maybe we can start with that and then get into some more specifics from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it's amazing. And I also have seen, especially the last, the last year, I've seen a lot of interest. People are looking to create these experiences, you know, to get, just go out there and, and, and run and run retreats. For me, it's amazing because you have the experience of a retreat. It's, it's, it's great because you have the container. I find it's very fascinating to have a place where people go and connect and, and, and you get to do like kind of amazing connections into that container where there is a lot of intimacy and, and also transformation. I can speak hours about that transformation and I, can, I have countless cases of people that I've seen coming on day one to their retreat and having one phase 
and living after the retreat and looking like a completely different person. It's amazing. You get to, to see how people experience that transformation. I think that is beautiful. And I find also it's also very convenient because, you know, while you organize a retreat, you can do the retreat. It's going to probably last six to 10 days or, you know, it could last more or less. But prior to the retreat, you can work from anywhere, really, because all the work that you have to do is to market and to sell and to set up the website and so on. But also one of the good points about running a retreat is that if you price it correctly, it's going to, it's going to be a, prof, a profitable venture. So what are the things that I like to share with yoga teachers who are planning to run a retreat? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about the things anyone, regardless of their experience, including beginners, they can do right now. If they are planning to do a retreat for anyone who is listening, if, if this is something that you may be having time for the future, the first thing, if you are in, at the beginning of your yoga journey, of course, I would advise you to gain teaching experience. This is something, of course, you need to have. Maybe you've done, you are fresh from your teacher training. This is the time to integrate that and to learn. It is also time, and I'm sure you're going to like and you're going to agree with that one, with this one, Amanda. It is time to already, you know, starting to define your niche, who is the people that you want to work with, and start creating community. I think this is something that anyone, regardless of, of your experience on, on retreats, this is something that you can start to do right now because that is going to be helpful in the future. So start create, looking for the, the, the people that may join your retreat in the future and start sharing some value with them so that you can create this community. And something that I think that could be very helpful as well is to either you can go on a retreat yourself and experience and see how it feels like for you. Or if you know some other teacher who is organizing a retreat, maybe you can, you can collaborate or partner up and see how the experience is for you as well. Mm, I love that tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can also work on a retreat, as I did, you know, because you're also going to get uh, to see the inside out. Those are things that anyone can do. What are the things that, you know, you can do as well right now is if you're going to teach a retreat in the future, it's probably a good idea to start thinking about the venue. Where do you want to host that retreat? And you could even connect with that venue, even though your retreat is going to be from, you know, two or three years from now, even, you could already connect with the venue that you feel it could be a good fit for your retreat. And you can start asking them critical questions. What are those critical questions? Okay, you can ask them about the contract. What kind of contract do they have? Because remember, if you're going to book a venue for running a retreat, you're likely going to have to pay a deposit. So that's another question and another thing you want to know. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you want to minimize that risk of losing your deposit. So you need to know about the cancellation policies and so on and so forth. What other things you can ask the venue is that if they are going to promote your retreat in their marketing, either their social media or their website. This is something that can help you a lot with the bookings. And Finally, another thing that I would ask the venue is if they have some farm trip. I don't know if yoga teachers are going to be familiar with this term, farm trip, but basically it's a familiarization trip where you get special rate as retreat leader. You could ask if they have farm trips. They would give you a special rate and you can go there and experience the place. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. Those are things that any yoga teacher who is planning to run a retreat in the future, you can start doing that. You can start doing that as an exercise. Also see how is the communication with the venue. Next thing that I would consider would be choosing your target audience. Remember, we were talking about who are those people who are going to come to the retreat and the theme for your retreat. And those two like kind of really go together. They really tie together. Because depending on your audience, depending on your target, your ideal client, the person that is going to come to your retreat, there's going to be a different theme. And the theme is going to develop around this person, 
the struggles they are going with in life, their desires, and, and so on. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good stuff. Mm -hmm. Something that I like every yoga teacher to understand is that your retreat is not, is not the perfect fit for anyone scrolling in the internet, okay? Because sometimes I've seen that a lot of times, you know, wellness, yoga, retreat. Who is this for? I don't know. And we hope it's for sometimes, everyone. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We hope sometimes that people will be navigating the internet and they would feel called to our retreat. I don't know why, but we need to be very specific. That's for sure. So key question, who is this retreat for? Who this retreat is going to be for? What does my retreat address a well-being problem that my ideal client or student may have right now? That's another good question that you can ask yourself. And also, do you have a community right now of students or clients, current clients, previous clients that they would be interested into coming? They would be a perfect fit for your retreat. That's also another interesting thing to see. Maybe even I would say ask them about what are the things that they would like to to, to have on a retreat. They can give you a lot of ideas and inspirations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really great tip as well. Amazing. Uh, so let's say I, I like to give myself a lot of time. All of the things that we are talking right now, when I'm planning my retreats, I like to give myself at least one year. So the next thing that I would try to understand is where I'm going to teach that retreat. We were searching for venues when that's going to be, you need to have those dates, and how much it's going to cost me. And this, again, Amanda, this is a super critical question because this is where I see many retreat leaders have a lot of roadblocks and they have a setbacks because they do a retreat and it involves a lot of work. There are so many moving pieces into a retreat. So if you don't make this a profitable venture, Trust me, you're going to burn out. You're going to be like, I don't want to do this again. <laughs> For sure. I feel like this is huge. I feel like this is a huge piece of this. It is. Yeah. And coming back to what I mentioned before, remember what I tell you about the hotels, the hotels, the hotels that I, that I, especially the last hotel that I were, we would charge huge prices. And, you know, it's not about uh, charging huge prices, but for sure it's about making something profitable and that you feel like really good and you feel that there is like a really nice exchange of value. And of course, it is about also trying to show, showcase the value of the product or the service that you're offering. That is critical. So you need to understand how much is it going to cost you to rent a venue, how much the room is going to cost you, how much the food is going to cost you. Are you going to include the transportation from the hotel to the venue, everything, everything, everything. You need to calculate that, basically. And then on the top of that, you need to include also the revenue that you want to do. How much? Of course, this depends on you. But I would always recommend to, you know, be generous. Be generous because when you plan a retreat, there is just so much work behind the scenes that, you know, you, you really want to make it profitable. Yeah, for sure. I think this is where yoga teachers get hung up as they want it to be affordable for their students. And then they kind of cut that revenue off the top. And then it's like, okay, I've got my expenses covered. And like, sure, I'm in Southern Thailand, but it's like you're working the entire time, right? Like you're holding space for people, you're, you're being a host, you're teaching all that type of stuff. So I think this is huge, huge, huge is that we got to make sure we add that revenue, make sure we pay ourselves so that it's profitable for us as teachers. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100% agree on that. Because yeah, there is so many moving pieces. And you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a big venture, you know, like taking a group of people, there are so many things that is, and, and it's not only during their retreat, actually, for me, personally, during their retreat, because I feel very comfortable, perhaps of because of my background, uh, the, the week or the 10 days that I'm teaching the retreat, this is where I feel more relaxed, because I feel that I can enjoy kind of with with my clients. But all of the prior preparation to that, to me, this is like kind of the, the, the bigger kind of piece of the puzzle. 
And this is exactly what I want to talk about right now, which is the marketing. And I know you can tell a lot about this because you also talk a lot, speak a lot about marketing. You know how important this is. And, and there is nothing, if I should, if I want to, to resume this into a few words, I would say there are many places where you can market this, but the best place is to market to the people that already know, like, and trust you. We get caught up sometimes into the retreat websites, like book yoga retreats and so on. I think those are good because, you know, it will give you uh, exposure. And some people go there to, to find retreat destinations. But what I would discourage every yoga teacher is to rely solely on those websites. Okay? I would say... Most important thing, have an email list of people who know, like, and trust you. That's the first place to market your retreat. And then, you know, look about, as I mentioned before, the retreat venue. If they're going to market that into, your, into their website, into their social media. Yes, it's okay also to look for the retreat uh, marketing websites, but I wouldn't make them a priority. And then, you know, of course, social media, anywhere where you want to market, you want to basically crane through to the rooftop you know that you're running a retreat and and you want to share with everyone and it, yeah i love that yeah i think it's so important too because i think we can get caught up in like should i run facebook ads and like what should my ads say and how much should i spend and it's like why don't we focus on the people who like you said know like and trust us because those are the people who are really gonna be interested in this right off the get-go and all the other marketing is important too it's it's i'm not saying that it's not but i think that really starting with your people is really important. Sometimes we discredit the people that are in our immediate kind of vicinity in our community already. Yes, yes. It's funny how, how this happened, right? Because you have people who, who already bought from you in the past. They bought from you in the past. But sometimes we almost like kind of think of those people like less and we kind of think like we need to reach new people and, and so on. But actually those people who already came to your class, those people who already attended your workshop or, or came to your retreat in the past are likely going to be the first one who are going to sign up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Amazing. Any other tips for running retreats that you want to share? Now, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the, the length and the, and the destination of the retreats. Yeah. Yeah. How do you choose those? Like, what's a good, do you have any tips for how you kind of choose choose length and destination? I'm going to keep it very brief. If you are doing an international retreat, if you are taking a group of people traveling far away, I maybe taking a plane, I wouldn't do it less than six, seven days. I think my preference is to do it even, you know, from seven to 10 days, if you're going to be traveling into, into an international destination, just because it takes a few days for you to, to reach there and, and so on. Yeah, I've seen retreats even like three days retreat, I think is the, the, the shortest that I've seen. I've seen other people do also one day retreats, which could be done in, you know, if it's like kind of in your area and so on. But my tip here would be for international retreats, don't, don't do it less than one week. I'm curious then, how do you choose a destination? Like, are you a fan of, I know you've talked about like the destinations that you've done retreats or like destinations, you know, well, is that something you would recommend for people like somewhere that you know, well, that you've been before that type of thing that you've, you've kind of like been to the venue, sussed it all out, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I think that that is the plus, you know, that is the plus because then when you write on your website, on your retreat landing page, when you write about the venue, you can also show that personal connection that you have either with the with the place that you're going to be traveling to or with the venue and so that will entice people to 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 join your retreat as well because you're going to be conveying that storytelling aspect you know which is part of your story and and you can convey that into your marketing however i also understand that some retreat leaders may not maybe they have not been to a destination it can be done as well you don't have to to be there i think it's a good thing to be there before but if you are not there you can you can also run a retreat definitely my tip here would be what is the theme for your retreat and who is your niche for the retreat again it goes it ties together you know 
You wouldn't take the different demographics, different even psychographics, different people would like to to go to one place depending on who they are and and you know what their goals are as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's so important because I think you've probably heard this before. It's like if you're trying to talk to everyone or trying to please everyone, you're really like pleasing nobody. So I think it's really important to get clear on like who is this for? What are we going to do? You know, and if it's you're doing a bunch of ad- adventure activities, then somebody who has that, you know, mobility level is is going to be important. And I know it sucks to like exclude people from things, but I think sometimes that's how we can be successful with what we're offering is that we're really clear on like who it's for and who it's not for. And then that opens up the door for other teachers to create other opportunities for other types of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and you know, if, if we are specific, then our message is also going to become more specific. And, you know, like, I understand that not everyone, perhaps not everyone in, in your group of students is going to be able to afford, but they, those who cannot afford their retreat, maybe they can afford, you know, they can afford other, other way to practice with you as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Amazing. Well, that's so much good stuff around retreats. I think my last question for you is just if you have any other business lessons that you want to share with us today that you've learned through your career, your career, like I said before, has been so dynamic and so diverse. It's so fun to hear about that. So curious if there's any kind of last business lessons you want to leave listeners with today. Well, yes, absolutely. There are so many of them, you know, hard to pick, <laughs> <laughs> hard to pick one. But I would say that, you know, I would like to speak to resilience today because this is something that for sure for anyone who is running or starting the business or running the business, resilience is a big one, you know. It's something that we talk a lot about resilience, you know, and and just like kind of moving forward, finding that way to keep going. And what I believe is that true resilience lies in embracing adaptability and also innovation. Sometimes we might have some ideas of uh, how things are going to go, but then we talk about it today, you know, then the pandemic happened and, and you need to, to find a way to, to embrace that adaptability. And what I would encourage every yoga teacher who is running a business or starting to run a business is that rather than viewing setbacks as a defeat, see them as a catalyst for growth and transformation. This is something that I try to work on myself. It's very, as you know, Amanda, it's very easy sometimes to get into, you know, especially because we tend to spend a lot of time alone working and sometimes it's easy to get into your own negative thoughts and stuff. So yeah, it is important to to get to see um, those setbacks as, you know, what do you learn from them? What is the silver lining? What are the things that I can take for myself? And finally, <clears throat> what I also would say to any yoga teacher who is listening, maybe if you feel that struggle, if you feel that you are in that moment of dark night of the soul, I don't know how to move forward. Please don't be as stubborn as I was at the beginning when I didn't want to have help and ask for help. Yes, huge, huge, huge. Huge, huge. And I know there is, you know, probably there are many people out there, but, you know, as I say, just pick someone that you know, like, and trust. Someone that, you know, you might have uh, already received some help in the form of some, you know, piece of valuable content or someone you connect with, someone you feel it's, it's the right person for you and ask for help. It's if I, yeah, if I would go back in time, you know, I would have done that right from the start. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Just sometimes there's this stubbornness of like, I have to do this myself, but it's like, we don't have to do it all ourselves. We can really lean into people who can support us, who have that experience, which On that note, I know that you support yoga teachers and so many things that they're doing with their business. So I'm curious if people want to work with you, where can they go to find that? If they want to do retreats with you, et cetera, et cetera. Can you share all that good stuff with us? Of course. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Amanda. So the best place to find me, it's uh, my website, yogabeastmentor.com. And also I tend to hang up, hang out on Instagram as well, yogabeastmentor separate with the dot each word and but i would say those are the places to go perhaps my website in my website for anyone who visit there is a 
free tab with some free resources on retreats and business that they are welcome to join if they feel the call. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today, Manu. This has been so great. You've shared so much good stuff and I'm, I'm so grateful that we got to have this conversation. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Amanda. It was great, fun, and super interesting to chat with you, you know? Amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, yoga teachers, I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the podcast with Menu. Make sure you go and check him out, check out his resources, reach out to him if he can support you in any way with your business. And of course, a big thank you to Offering Tree for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. And a big thank you to you for listening to the show, for sharing with your friends, all that good stuff. This is the second last episode of this season of the show. So we have one more episode next week and then we are done this season. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode and I hope you enjoy next week's final solo episode. So we will be back soon for that. Have a great week and I will see you then. Bye for now. Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode of the podcast. To find links, notes, resources, and everything mentioned in today and all episodes of the show, you can head on over to mbomyoga.com. You can find the podcast and myself on Facebook and social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga. And I would love for you to join the private Facebook community, Yoga Business Badasses. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please make sure you reach out to me at info at mbomyoga.com. And last of all, if you enjoyed this episode of the show, please make sure you hit subscribe and leave a review for the podcast. It would mean the world. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next week. Namaste. Namaste.